Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. And I'm Marty Kelsey. And this is STEM in 30. What's our topic, Marty? This is your show. I, I planned the last one. Um, uh, wait a minute. That sounds like breaking news from Nick Partridge. Let's see what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt your regularly scheduled STEM in 30 program to bring you this special report. I'm standing here live in front of the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory in Washington, D.C., where about 20 minutes ago, astronomy educator Shauna Edson reported observing several large explosions of incandescent gas on the surface of Mars. The spectroscope indicates that the gas is hydrogen and is headed towards Earth at enormous velocity. Edson reported the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, end quote. It is our belief that Martians have launched ships towards Earth to begin an invasion. One thing is certain, there is no stopping them. Let's go to footage now from NASA. <laughs> Stop! That's not Mars invading Earth. This is Earth invading Mars. Where are Beth and Marty? We've got to get this right. Beth, Marty, there seems to be a lot of confusion out there about Mars. I think we could straighten it out. I think we've found our topic. Do you have time? We have about 30 minutes. Uh, I'm new here. Why 30 minutes? Well, because this, this is, is STEM in 30. 30. Hi, we are now coming to you live from the Exploring the Planets Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum. This gallery really does show that if you set your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Let's go look around. Yeah. Here in the Exploring the Planets Gallery, you can discover the planets, moons, asteroids, dwarf planets, and comets in our solar system, and learn about the spacecraft that travel great distances to study them. In this gallery, you'll find three generations of Mars rovers, as well as the Stardust capsule, which was the first to bring back a sample from a comet. There's also the Blink Comparator, which Clyde Tombaugh used to discover Pluto in 1930. Of course, there's also a full-scale model of the New Horizons spacecraft, which in 2015 showed us the heart of Pluto. But today we're not talking about Pluto. That's for another show. Today we're talking about Mars. Well, before we get started, let's welcome our students today. Whittier Education Campus, thank you guys so much for coming in. We can't wait to hear your questions later in the show. And if you're joining us online, be sure to submit questions. We may answer them live on the air. We also have a docent standing by to answer the questions that you submit. But to get us started today, we have some students that are asking us a question. Hi, I'm Stephanie May from South Valley Middle School in Liberty, Missouri. And we are wanting to you know why is there such a fascination with Mars? Well, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about why there's a fascination with Mars. But right now, I'm joined by Dr. John Grant, one of the scientists here at the museum. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Hi, guys. John, what got you interested in Mars? Um, when I grew up in northern New York State, I looked out around me and I saw lakes and I saw rivers. And when I was a teenager, the Viking landers landed on Mars. And lo and behold, I saw dry lakes and dry rivers in terms of the images. And it really made me think about the possibility that there could have been life on Mars. Now, part of your job is working with Mars rovers. So you get to drive these things and go out and discover things. So do you sit in your office with you know, like a game console where you turn it and push the gas and move it around? I wish, but it turns out that you can't drive a rover on Mars that way for a couple reasons. One, you want to make sure you don't drive into something, but really because Mars is so far away that it takes a long time for the signal to get from Earth to Mars and back. 
So there's a delay. You wouldn't really be able to do things in real time because you wouldn't be able to see where you went. Now, if, a, if one of the rovers is driving along, and let's say there's a hole, uh, does it just fall into the hole? No. What we do uh, through the rover planners of the Jet Propulsion Lab is plan what we call keep-out zones. Things that are hazards, things that are outside the bounds of where we want to go are, con are considered off-limits. But then the rover also has sort of hazard avoidance things. So if there's something that pops up unexpectedly, which has never happened, uh, it would know not to drive off a cliff. Well, we have some friends who are actually trying to program some robots. Uh, do you want to see how they're doing? I'm curious <laughs> if they do better than we do. Okay, let's take a look. All right, so we've got a couple of friends here, and they're getting ready to drive some spheroid rovers. Now, the way that these work is you plot a course for them on the uh, iPad, and you hit go. And so you've got to kind of pre-plot your course. Now, we've got a couple of craters over here. I want to see if you guys can uh, end up in one of those craters. Give it a try. Keep going. See if you can hit that, uh, hit the mark there. Well, you guys are, oh, the, the, that was really, you did it. Great job. Nice work. I will tell you guys, I am tremendously bad at this. So you guys did a much, much better job. Beth, these guys are on a roll. Let's go back over to you and John. What do you think they uh, could be your next Mars <laughs> rover so. drivers? No, I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a little harder than one might expect, though. Exactly, exactly. I, I think it's kind of complicated. Yeah, well, they have another rover that they're trying out over there. This one's got a little camera. Shall we go back and see sure, if this is, see this is better? That. All right, so this one's a little bit of a different concept. There is a camera on the front of this rover, and you're going to drive it around, but we're going to make it a little harder. Instead of actually seeing the terrain, we're going to turn you around so all that you can see is the camera on the rover. So go ahead and see if you can find a really cool destination here on Mars. Go for it. Oh, you're getting there. Oh, keep going. So talk me through. Is this harder than you thought it would be? Yes. Why? Because you can't see the robot while you're driving it. That it is, um, it's hard to drive on a tablet. All right. Well, Beth, as you can see over here where we're driving, you don't need roads. There aren't any roads on Mars. No. <laughs> and that was a little more difficult, even with the camera. Yeah, I, I think sometimes the camera helps quite a lot in terms of our planning, because as we saw, you can kind of get the lay of the land in front of you from that rover's eye perspective, and then kind of identify the hazards and the interesting things and plot a path through them. Are you ready for some questions? I am ready for All some right, questions. let's start with a video question. My name is Michaela, and my question is, when did the first robot emerge on Mars? What's the first robot on Mars? Well, the first robot that landed on the surface successfully and operated were the Viking landers back in 1976. And as I said earlier, that's kind of the thing that got me piqued my interest in planetary geology. So we've been on Mars for a while. Yes, we have. Well, let's try an online question. Let's see. Are there places on Mars where the rovers can't go? There's two kinds of places the rover can't go. One has to do with hazards. If the, the hill is too steep, if the rocks are too big, we can't go to those places. The other kind of place we can't go is where there might be life on Mars. We don't know if there's life on Mars, but there's places where there, if there is, it's likely to occur, places where there might be liquid water today. So those are sort of steer clear places as well. Okay, I think we have a student who has a really great question about taking pictures. Come on up. Is there a scientific reason reason for the rover to take selfies? There is. Um, the rovers take selfies uh, for two reasons. One, because usually we've just drilled a hole in the rocks and it allows us to provide context for where the drill hole is, the things around it, and where the rover was sitting. The other time that we take selfies uh, is to understand what's happening with the rover, to look down, for example, on Opportunity and see how much dust is accumulated on the solar panel. So there's both operational and scientific reasons. It's not just for their Facebook page. No, it's not just for their Facebook okay. page. And we have another video question. Okay. Let's... Hi, my name is Michaela, and my question is, why is it important that we found water on Mars? 
Why is it important that we found water on Mars? Well, I started to say this a little bit earlier, and then I lost my train of thought, but really water is something on the Earth that we associate with life. Where we find water, we find life. And so the idea is that on Mars, if we've got liquid water, then potentially that relationship holds true because water is the key to many of the kinds of things that life needs to get going. Well, we were able to talk to some astronauts and we got their thoughts on Mars. So do you want to take a look at what they had to say? I would love to. Let's see. Well, you're looking for the signature of life. Um, you, you know, there's not going to be somebody standing up going, hi, welcome <laughs> to Mars. So you're looking for things like carbon dioxide that we breathe out, or if it's an anaerobic system, one without oxygen, you might get you know, sulfur dioxide or sulfur-based compounds. There are a number of different things that you could be looking for, and you have to hone in on what's there and then uh, refine it. So it, it, it's an iterative process like most science is. <laughs> Well, I was there in space for about six months, five and a half months, and my skeleton, you know, lost uh, a lot of weight. My muscles change, my eyes change, uh, my way of perceiving things change. And, uh, and so we need to understand all this uh, mechanism, the impacts that we have on our body, and we need to make sure that we have the capability of preserving the, the body, the functionality of the body over this long period of time, which is two to three years. We're looking at ways to provide astronauts with autonomy. If I call the ground from the International Space Station, I get an immediate response. But if I'm traveling and I'm near the Martian surface, it's gonna take a long time to get that response. So astronauts and the ground team that support them are going to need to figure out how to deal with those type of psychological issues. I'd say there's two big challenges. One is the transportation to get there, and then the second has to do with health. When you look at transportation, now we're going 30 million to 250 million miles away depending on how the planets are aligned. Uh -huh. It's a long time to get there. It's a big distance, so we need a vehicle that can get us there. When you talk about health, um, how are we gonna react being in space for that long with the uh, radiation problem? And then we have food, water, all those things that we take for granted here. Well, we astronauts uh, in space uh, are guinea pigs uh, in a certain way. And one of the way that we help in planning uh, the Mars mission is, is allowing the scientists to look at our body and see what happens when you stay in microgravity for a long time. Right now we have Scott Kelly up there for an entire year because we need to push beyond six months if we're going to send someone to Mars. And then what's going on with our machinery? How's the reliability? How's our environmental control system? Is it keeping us alive? Is it breaking down? Do we need to supply spare parts? Um, now we're even looking at 3D printing, which I think is gonna have a great application to go to Mars. And so all of it together, it's everything together. It's the human living, it's the scientific research, it's the machinery and the reliability. Whether it be recycling their urine into drinking water or finding ways to break down water into hydrogen to give them an oxygen, to give them breathing material, um, and how to, to uh, grow plants in space so that perhaps they can eat their salads that they grow in the spaceship. So it's really important for people to be focusing on the future with recycling capability and ways to eliminate the need to carry big massive things into space. We're now joined by Matt Schindel, a curator here at the National Air and Space Museum. Now, we've been fascinated with Mars for a long, long time. Why is that? Well, I think mainly that there's two, two good reasons why we've been fascinated with Mars for so long. One is that it's been very good at holding on to its mysteries and keeping them close to itself. And, and the other is that it's really changed significantly at least twice during the time that, that humans have been observing it, or at least what we see when we look at Mars has changed twice significantly. So keep in mind that the original observations of Mars uh, were done with the naked eye. So Mars at that point was really just a, a point of light in the sky. And because there wasn't really an idea about Mars and the Earth both orbiting uh, the sun, the movements of Mars were a mystery to the people who were observing it. Um, now that changed with the age of the telescope in the 1600s when uh, Galileo in 1610 looked at Mars through his telescope. Uh, Mars started to transform from that point of light into um, you know, more of a, a planet like we know it today. The definition of the word planet changed from wandering star 
to more of what we know today. Um, and from that point up until the mid-19th century, astronomers kept observing Mars with better and better telescopes uh, and even began mapping the surface. Unfortunately, because of the Earth's atmosphere, Mars was always really difficult to see. It was, it was never a clear image of Mars. Um, now, that brings us you know, into the 19th century to one of the biggest sort of popularizers of Mars as an interesting object and as a possible uh, abode of life, and that was Percival Lowell, who was a, a very wealthy Bostonian and an astronomer who decided that he would build the best observatory for observing Mars, and he would build it in Flagstaff, Arizona, which he thought the altitude was high enough and the atmosphere was clear enough that he would actually be able to see the surface of Mars clearly. And what we have here in front of us is a globe that, uh, that Lowell had made. Well, this is a reproduction of a globe that he had made in 1905, showing what he said he saw through his telescope. And as you can see, it's covered in these canal systems, which he took as evidence of intelligent life on Mars, of a dying civilization that was essentially dealing with an ecological disaster, trying to um, you know, keep crops alive as in an inhospitable climate. Now, of course, Lowell actually was still seeing a blurry image and didn't see these canals. Uh, we have an image from Mariner 4, uh, which shows a very heavily cratered surface of Mars, almost moon-like. We sent Mariner to Mars in 1965. It flew by, took these images, and, and really blew the idea of canals on Mars out of, out of the water, so to speak. Um, and uh, also led scientists to believe that, that Mars maybe wasn't even going to be that interesting of a place, maybe just a lot like our moon. But then they sent Mariner 9 in 1971. And Mariner 9 went around in, in orbit around Mars and mapped the surface, found all kinds of interesting things. In fact, when it first arrived, uh, it met a global dust storm that was covering the entire surface of Mars. They couldn't see anything. But as that dust storm slowly subsided, they saw the top of the, the tallest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. And as it further subsided, they eventually saw a, a huge canyon system about as wide as the entire United States of America uh, that's called Valles Marineris. So Mars was not Lowell's Mars. It didn't have the canyons, but it was, or sorry, not the canyons, the canals. But nonetheless, it was incredibly exciting and dynamic. And so our interest in it has still persisted. That's cool. So are you ready for some questions? Yes. All right, we've got a friend at South Valley Middle School asking a question. My name is Julia, and my question is, why are so many of the science fiction books based off of Mars? Great, Scott. That's a great question. <laughs> I think that the answer to that really lies with Lowell. Lowell uh, ignited the imagination of the idea of an inhabited Mars, a Mars with an interesting story with ancient Martians and canal systems. And you see that in a lot of the science fiction that followed after the 1890s. You know, H.G. Wells with his War of the Worlds, Ray Bradbury with his Martian Chronicles. These stories were stories about ancient Martians interacting with humans on Earth. And, and uh, really, I think that comes out of Lowell. Cool. All right, we've got an online question next. Do you think Mars will ever be colonized? That's a very difficult question to answer because Mars right now is a very inhospitable place and it would take a lot of resources um, to, to terraform it in any way. So if, if we ever do live there, it might be in a very sort of limited sense in small self-contained areas. Cool. All right, we've got an audience question next. What is your favorite Mars sci-fi? My favorite Martian science fiction, I would say that that, for this time of year, would be Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles. It's a nice, poetic, kind of creepy set of stories about Mars, and um, it even includes a sort of recreation or reimagination of um, Edgar Allan Poe's Fall of the House of Usher, done with robots and a mechanical uh, haunted house. So I recommend that for this time of year. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about kind of our fascination with Mars throughout history. But let's go back over to Beth and John to learn more about Mars today. So John, where are all of these robots that we've put on Mars? Well, the ones that have landed on Mars are in different locations depending on what the goal of the mission was. The map that you see here shows, for example, where our rovers are, Opportunity and Spirit, the Mars Exploration rovers, they were really going after understanding the role of water in shaping the surface of Mars. Curiosity is kind of between the two, and it's the sort of big sister, if you will, that's really going after the question of whether Mars might have been habitable. 
Now, what did Spirit and Opportunity find that was particularly interesting? Well, starting with Spirit, uh, we landed in a place called Gusev Crater, and after driving for a while, discovered these layered rocks that also show hints through their chemistry and their form that they were actually in place during a volcanic eruption through sediments that were at least at, for a time wet. And how long have these been running? They've been running a long time. For example, Spirit was going for a long time such that one of the six wheels stopped working and we were dragging it. And that turned out to be sort of a lemonade out of lemon situation where as you can see from this bright white streak here, as the wheel was scraping across the surface, getting the dust out of the way, we found this material called silica. And that silica was in place in a steam vent or maybe even a uh, some sort of fumarole around a volcanic center like I showed you before and tells us that this place might have been once like a miniature sort of Yellowstone. Um, hot, but wet, and perhaps maybe habitable. And is Opportunity still running? Opportunity after 11 and a half plus years is still cranking along. Here's a view looking back. You can see our tracks fading in the distance as we've been driving along the rim of a very large crater called Endeavor Crater trying to understand the ancient geology of Mars. Now, how long were they supposed to run? They were supposed to last about three months, 90 sols, which is just a little bit longer than 90 Earth days. But as you can see, we've been tra traversing very incredible terrain. This is still on the rim of Endeavor Crater. This is a place called Marathon Valley. And if you look carefully, you can see color variations within the valley that we think uh, are somehow related to occurrence of clay that we see from orbit that tells us that water was here for an extended period and that that water existed in a form that wasn't too acetic, wasn't too basic, but maybe just right and might be, again, representing these sort of habitable conditions early in Mars history. And Curiosity is doing a, something different. Curiosity is building on the results of the Mars Exploration rovers and really going after habitability. For example, what you see here in this slide are a bunch of layered rocks that are sedimentary rocks that in this case we know now through exploration were deposited as water drained down the, the wall of the large crater, Gale Crater, that we were in and deposited them as sediments flowing into a lake. And the layered rocks that you see here now, we're currently exploring and trying to understand what they represent about a change of environment from that early lake environment within Gale Crater. Shall we take some questions? Let's do. Let's take some questions. My name's Riley and my question is, why is Mars red? Why is Mars red? Mars is red because it's rusting. Uh, I grew up in northern New York, it snowed a lot, and they used to put salt on the roads and my car would rust. And the same thing is happening to the iron minerals in the rocks on Mars, they're rusting, and that's what gives it its reddish color. And we have an online question. How long does it take to travel to Mars? Uh, it takes months, and even when Mars is as close to the Earth as it can be, uh, as we heard from our astronauts earlier, uh, this is not a trip that is for the faint of heart or for the impatient. Uh, it's a long, long ways away, tens of millions of miles, and it takes anywhere from, you know, six to perhaps nine or ten months. And we have, uh, one of our audience members has a question for you. My name is Roshonda, and my question is, how do you know what rocks on Mars are made of? How do you know what rocks on Mars are made of? We do a couple of different things. We actually analyze the rocks directly to understand what's within them. We take samples with curiosity and, and do that. Uh, but we also do it through something called remote sensing, where we use cameras and other instruments that look at different wavelengths of light and can tell how the different compositions reflect light differently. Just like my hand is a different color than this wood, there's information there about what those different things are made of. Let's take another video question. My name is Destiny and my question is, how long is a day on Mars? How long is a day on Mars? Well, at first glance, it's about the same as an Earth day, but it's actually about 40 minutes longer. And that really messes with you when you're trying to work on Mars time. Do you work on Mars time? We used to work on Mars time. When these missions first started operating on the surface for about three or four months, we did. But the problem is about every two weeks, you actually go through a whole cycle of an Earth day so you might start on uh, the first day of the mission at 8 a.m. in the morning, but a week later you're at 8 p.m. at night. Oh, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. It's not a lot of fun because it's not like uh, getting on a plane and getting off six hours later and being jet lagged. It changes every single day. Ugh. Well, 
we are doing research to get us to Mars, and we visited NASA headquarters where they have something really cool that we should take a look at. Let's do I'm here at NASA headquarters, and I'm joined by Marshall Porterfield. Now, we're standing in front of Veggie, the vegetable production system. Can you tell me about this? This is a, a demonstration unit, a mock-up of the exact hardware system that's operational right now on the International Space Station. We're using it right now to demonstrate our ability to grow plants in space and also produce vegetable crops, which can be used to feed the crew. Now, the light in here is very weird looking. Why is that? Well, this is uh, an example of efficiency for spaceflight hardware. So we're using red and blue light to feed photosynthetic light to the plants. And it's, it's designed to very precisely feed the wavelengths of light that the plants require for photosynthesis only, as opposed to white light, which would include green wavelengths, which would just simply bounce off, be reflected back off the plant. So it's, a, it's an example of uh, electrical efficiency and uh, photosynthesis. So that's why the plants in there look kind of dull rather than the bright green that we're used to when we see plants. That's Brilliant. right. There's no, there's no green photons being wasted. Awesome. Now, how is this a step towards a future trip to Mars? Well, we really wanted to demonstrate our ability to grow vegetable crops. We wanted to also demonstrate that the, that the, the plants that we do produce are healthy and are free of pathogens in a spaceflight environment. This demonstrates our ability to be able to grow those types of crops, which are going to be very important in long duration human missions. Not only for the plants to produce nutritious food, help recycle the atmosphere, absorb CO2 and produce oxygen, but also for the psychological comfort of having a piece of home. We recently grew a crop of uh, lettuce on the International Space Station and we provided the crew with a little bit of vinaigrette salad dressing and they say that they enjoyed that, uh, that experience quite a bit. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. No problem. Well, we have a lot more work to do before we get to Mars. I think so. And I appreciate you joining us to it's tell, pleasure. telling us about the work you're doing. Now, on November 18th, we will be talking about 15 years of living on the International Space Station. Check this out. Check this out. That's Buzz Lightyear, but not any Buzz Lightyear. This guy spent 15 months aboard the International Space Station, 250 miles up. And he didn't just go along for the ride. He was up there helping with microgravity experiments. This guy's on display at the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And if you think this is interesting, be sure to check out STEM in 30. Well, thanks for joining us today. We'd like to thank NASA for sponsoring us, and we hope to see you next month.